Welcome to the conversation presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. My name is Paul Grandal and I'm the director of the Writers Institute. Before I introduce today's guest, Richard Loverich, let me remind you that, that this interview and all of our author interviews can be found on our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And to keep up with all of our programming, go to our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. And if you like what you see and what you read and what you hear and want to support us in the future, you can make a donation there at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. We'd be very grateful for that. Now, before uh, we get to our guest uh, and, and get to the book, uh, Have a Very Bad Day, I want to say a few words about Richard Leverage. Full disclosure, he and I, former colleagues at the Times Union, where he was uh, art director. He's also, I worked with him um, when he was uh, creative director at Proctor's. And uh, this is his newly published book, Have a Very Bad Day. It's an ironic, uproarious, darkly comic series of micro stories, or what these days might be called nano fiction. They're short, pack a wicked punch, kind of like haiku gone amuck is the way I like to think of it. Um, but there's an amazing, creative, quirky, twisted force of nature, a mind at work here. It's a pleasure to be in the company of, of such uh, absurdly funny situations and, and characters who are both clueless and hapless. And to give you a little taste of the book, it's, it's also uh, Richard is, is a wonderful art designer and we'll talk about what these figures mean. It's a very carefully, beautifully designed book. But here's a little taste of, of what's in store uh, when you get this book and read it. Have a very bad day, asks life's important questions. Can a colonoscopy lead to romance? Why was that Portuguese man of war hiding in a laundry basket? Did that little girl really mean to have her, uh, mean to leave her brother to drown? This collection of terse tales reminds us that on our way to success, life may place a boulder, an ax, the large hadron super collider, a bullet, an unfaithful spouse, a conflagration, a cannibal, dishwasher, French baker, hamburger, or meteor in our path. If you laugh at these stories, that is okay, as bad people need books too. Richard, thank you, and uh, it's good to have you at the conversation. It's very, thank you so much for having me, Paul. It, it's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, let's talk about um, people who you have a lot of followers and friends on Facebook. These kind of started as, as were they an exercise? Were they a, a little uh, attempt at, at small stories? You, you would post a different one each day on Facebook. It was exactly that. It was an exercise. Well, it started as an experiment to see if I could post a thousand short stories. And that experiment did turn into an exercise. And uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful process. They weren't all great, of course but it was a wonderful way to wake up and quite challenging at times. It's, it's a groove like anything else, right? right? And once in that groove, it was difficult to get out of it. Right. So, you know, the, the whole vibe is, is very dark, comic. Um, I know Edgar Allan Poe was an influence. I know you've talked about uh, others, Charles Adams. Talk about who, yes. who, who was your influence? Who, who are the writers and, and uh, you know, artists that, that really kind of float your boat? Well, you know, Charles Adams, uh, Poe, I, I read organically through school and took it much further. I lived in the Bronx and finding that Poe had spent time in the Bronx, that drove that interest even more. And uh, Adams, um, I was in the doctor's office a lot when I was a kid and they had the New Yorker. And so for me, Adams was just, uh, I just thought it was the best thing ever. I couldn't imagine. And when the TV show came out, that wasn't so bad, but it was really the cartoons. And a lot of other authors, authors came in and out there and films, of course, I love schlocky sci-fi and horror. Right. And uh, it, through that process, perhaps, of schlock, I think I, I did get that, uh, I learned 
that, yeah, you can be having a very bad time and laugh at the same time. So you're also diagnosed, uh, people will see you're on oxygen. I've known you for a long time. You were diagnosed with this rare lung disease, alpha one. Yeah. Did, did any of that in, inform your worldview, the type of thing when you get a bad diagnosis, laughter is the best medicine or, or was anything at all related to that diagnosis or? <laughs> yeah, you know, one doesn't want to be corny, but absolutely, it definitely did. In fact, the day I was diagnosed, since I've been symptomatic my entire life, because I have a comorbidity of asthma, so my lungs were being slowly destroyed throughout my life, and folks like myself are normally not diagnosed until our 50s, and, but I couldn't breathe already. So for me, when I, the day I was diagnosed, I got a speeding ticket. I was so excited. <laughs> you know, I was so happy yes. to finally have, because of course, with a diagnosis, no matter how dire the diagnosis, it gives you a um something to focus upon right yeah you, right. you have goals now and i've treated those goals seriously i'm a rare, rare disease advocate and i've done it in this country i've been all around the united states to portugal to croatia where i hosted an international conference and it's uh when you when i speak to other people with my disorder i who are movers and shakers i ask them i say would you be as involved if you if it was not a rare disease and universally, they, after they think a bit, they say, no, probably not. So right. the rarity of the disorder kind of demands that you step up. And yes, I think it is, uh, I do find funny, uh, find humor in dark places. I definitely do. Right. So is that, is that kind My of- My mother your... also, by the way, had a very dark, strange, dark sense of humor. <laughs> is that your, your own personal Sorry. default or are you kind of- creating a persona in this book or if if, if uh, you're telling stories at a cocktail party are they going to be this strange and twisted and and uh, and and kind of dark i do have that reputation yes <laughs> yeah i'm not invited to any more super bowl parties by the way <laughs> that, those days are over <laughs> um, i mean i always think of you with a with a leica around your neck you're a brilliant photographer um, you're always meticulously dressed and put together and, and, and you design beautiful things, but the words, I never thought of you as a word person. Does, do, does it come easily? Is it as easy as making an image with a, a camera for you or, or is it really struggling and drafts and drafts? And... That's, a, that's, a very, that's a very good question actually, because when, these stories began as single panel cartoons many years ago with illustrations. Right. And I liked making them. I made them for some years, but when I separated the two, some of them simply didn't work as cartoons, right? The stories were longer. And when the idea of placing that germ in someone's head and seeing what picture developed in their head was far more interesting to me than closing up the whole deal. And I have tremendous respect for the people who do it, do it, going back to the New Yorker again. I think it's a great art form. But for me, I found I derived much more pleasure uh, of, again, placing just the stories there. My brother uh, wrote, I'm from the Bronx and the Irish Bronx. And everybody thinks that means, you know, cops and firemen and superintendents of buildings. And that was true, but we live near Fordham University. Mm -hmm. So for my brother and I, there was also this window that opened up about uh, poetry and writing and, um, and my school, um, my grammar school, they did support that as well. So it, writing's always been important to me. Well, at the Times Union, of course, um, I was the art director, so my photographs were never put in for photo awards. I was in the wrong department, but I did win a headline writing <laughs> contest and... <laughs> <laughs> Which and, is always uh, hard. I'm not good at headlines. Headlines are difficult because there's so few words and you've got to pack a lot into a small space. Yeah. I actually suggest to other graphic artists who have not attempted, not tried their hand at headline writing to do so because it's very much the same process. Right. And if you're okay with language and you're not even if you're super adept at it, but if you're simply willing to learn more, you know, pick up a thesaurus and pick up a dictionary. It's that a, it's that skill set. You know, I've had this discussion with with you, frankly, with Michael Eck, other uh, many other writers that I know. I think people think of a thesaurus or a dictionary as a crutch, 
instead of their best friend. Right. You know, so for me, uh, the the germ of an idea is how I create an illustration. And the germ of an idea abstracted again is how you create a headline. Right. So the process is identical. Right. What is it about these marathons? Because you did a, a beautiful exhibit at Albany Center Gallery uh, a few years back where you did portraits wonderful black and white portraits of people in, in the creative arts all across the spectrum of creative arts. And you did one a day. I think you had 365, if I, yeah. if I recall. What is it about that you just have to keep, you know, these long-term projects that, and that you don't give up, that you take them on? And I think I'm a failed, lazy person. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I you know, I, I would have to be lying down on a couch somewhere. I'm not quite sure either, but I do enjoy it. Well, editing this book was, and you've authored many books, editing a book was this Herculean task and it was far more, uh, far more engrossing, engaging and difficult than simply writing a thousand short stories. So uh, I, I, I don't know what it would be like. I'm beginning a book that is not made of very tiny short stories. They're probably short episodes of my childhood in the Bronx. And that process I can see is going to be very different. But uh, again, it's, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a really, really, uh, it, it vexes me as well. I'm not quite sure. I am, it, well, instead of those challenges, the 365 days, the thousand stories, it's now writing books, writing and editing books. Right. And um, my hat's off to anyone that sits down to try to write a book or complete a book. Right. It's really quite a wonderful and it's a it's a very difficult thing to do. I also always enjoyed uh, when you were very much involved running the collaborative magazine, the arts magazine um, through Proctor's. Uh, while you were um, you know creative director, you were doing those studio visits where you would go see visual artists yeah. and you would take portraits and photographs and write a little story. What do you learn? You know, you're a creative person. Is, is it that spark that you got to itch your creative urge, you know, each day with these stories? Is, is, is it like going out for a run or a, a walk for some people? Um, I'm, I'm a massive fan of creatives of all kinds. And I do think they need defending um, in the workspace. So I think it started there. And so what, when I started at the Times Union, I brought, I came from the non-unionized self-employed world of art. And I brought an agency concept perhaps to the art department, even as an artist and then as the art director, because there had been this uh, tension between the artist and the people who were assigning them, uh, which, I didn't think made sense within that format. And so leaving that behind was important to me. And uh, so supporting creatives is very important, helping, helping creatives to communicate also, <clears throat> because they do tend to be um, in the wings, if you will, very few of them, of course, performing creatives, I would not include in that. But if you're talking about art illustrators and uh, certainly people in your local art departments, they're not the people who are going to necessarily stand up to defend themselves. And so I think the studio visits were an extension of that thought process where it's artist to artist without the attitude, I hope, you know, trying to be able to communicate what I saw in those studios, what those people were trying to accomplish, but do it in a way, hopefully, that uh, you didn't need to have a lot of specialized language and you didn't need to be an artist yourself. And again, it was just simply celebrating their, what made their work special. Right, and I know you've, you've talked about, you have a little stage fright. You're not a natural, you know, <clears throat> get up and perform, but before you publish this book, you would perform some of these at, at bars and other venues. Talk about what that experience was like. Well, now we go back to my diagnosis. When I was diagnosed, I looked, uh, which you would, I looked at my life and I had a dread fear of speaking in public. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I don't know how long I have to live. Um, my first diagnosis said not very, but I've, I've punched through that already. 
And um, I said, I'm not going to go to the grave not having done this. So someone actually invited me to speak at a gallery. And I said, I'm not going to say no. And I showed up. There was some technology to work out. Now, interestingly, um, when I read my short stories, I'm the most comfortable. So leave that up to the psychologist. But I mean, I'm frankly much more exposed. It's all about me. All the focus is on me. It's if you, you know, if you're going to laugh or not laugh, <clears throat> I didn't care. Uh, it was actually, and then that was the hump. Once I got over that hump, I'm now pretty good at speaking in public in, on just about anything. I'm not an expert expert. I'll put that out there. I really would prefer to limit, limit and my time on stage to things that I know a great deal about. So of course I talk about rare disease and rare disease advocacy, again, speaking for those who cannot speak, which is, because especially with a rare disease, if you take out the people who are simply not prepared to speak in public and the people who are too ill uh, to speak and the people that are yet to be diagnosed, there's an awful lot of people that cannot speak for themselves in the rare disease spectrum. So um, I, it behooves one to get up to that mic and tell their story. Wonderful. Well, I think you're prepared to give us a little flavor of have a very bad day. Would you read some of these uh, stories and these unfortunate incidents uh, that, that happened to your characters? <laughs> I absolutely will. You just uh, tell me when to stop. <laughs> Go for it. They're, they're, they're short. Now, what, what's the, um, the range of word lengths? Some are, are yeah. some like 50 words and some might be a few hundred words. Or... Exactly right. Um, my goal was to bring, you know, do each one in one sentence. I think my, <clears throat> my shortest story is a short play, and it is this. Please tell me there wasn't a baby in there. <laughs> so I believe that's my shortest story. <laughs> All right, let's give us a taste of Have a Very Bad Day, duly published by Richard Loveridge. Good shot. Cousin Phil, one of a pair of identical twins, nonetheless recognized himself with unerring accuracy in the childhood photos his aunt Erica unearthed after Christmas dinner. His brother Earl was the one who was rarely photographed without his air gun, while Phil was the kid with the patch where his left eye used to be. <laughs> I, I assume most of these are completely fabricated. Any of these drawn from real life? You, you, uh, you, didn't, um, you didn't put out I, your brother's eye, did you? With the <laughs> My wife does know which ones are autobiographical. But <laughs> You're not telling. All right. Not allowed to tell. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, that was important to me as well. There, there really aren't any, uh, there are, there's no politics in the book in 295 stories and that was on purpose. And also if you're going to the book, you may be drawn to the book out of schadenfreude about wanting to see people have a bad time, but in 295 fairly unique tales, you will run into yourself. It's impossible not to. So you'll slide from schadenfreude to self, to introspection. Right. <laughs> if you right. don't, I'd like to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear some more. Sure. Listen closely. Julius, a leading expert in the field of nanoacoustics, had labored for five years to perfect what, in effect, was the world's, world's smallest and most sensitive microphone. And today, for the very first time, he would focus it upon a petri dish with the hope of listening in on bacteria. What he heard was what every E. coli in town seemed to know already, that his wife Elaine was carrying on an affair with his research assistant, Otis. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing special. It was March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, and Marilyn groggily woke to televised warnings of planned, numerous, and randomly placed police checkpoints meant to trap drunken holiday motorists. How fair was this stepped up surveillance really, she asked herself, to folks who, like herself, drank and drove every day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
light housework. Grace's mom had spared the rod. Unfortunately, she had also spared the washing machine, iron, refrigerator, and oven. <laughs> the thin premise. Unhappy with her body, and after many attempts at weight loss, Carney decided to stop eating meat. In short order, she began reposting self-righteous, militant, vegan, meat is murder memes. She became so angry, filled with umbrage, and subsequently hungry, that she ordered jellied panda face from Amazon Prime. Upon taking delivery, she was arrested, deported, and imprisoned in a far-flung region of China. As her captors served only gruel, she became vegan again, thereby shedding 49 pounds. And now, chained to a rock in the open sun, she also looked very hot. <laughs> yeah, are the PC police going to come after you? Some of these are, are fairly uh, uh, wild and, and slightly naughty, you know. Um, uh, this is the cleaned up. Uh, there are okay. a few more adult ones yes. uh, that I do keep out of the like library and bookshop reading edition. Right. So, so this is uh, like uh, safe for all ages, this version. Not quite. You, okay. You're getting the slightly tangy version. Okay. <laughs> In yes. fact, that story was a uh, cleaned up version of a midnight type read that I do at certain restaurants. Yeah. If people are drinking enough. And they are a rapid fire set of in, unfortunate social media posts. Right. And that's where that story came from. And I'm afraid it became, I'm afraid it was much, much darker. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice. laughs> but it cleans up well. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, let's have a few more. Okay, let's go. To each, Johan described to Emma in refreshingly few words, the basics of particle physics. Emma informed him that she wasn't wearing any underwear. <laughs> <clears throat> to have and to hold. Oh, Jenny, oh, Jenny, what was it that drew me to you? What was it that put me under your spell? What was it that has kept me with you here, lo, these many years? And then Lawrence remembered in just that order, the misleading Craigslist ad, the drugged cocktail, and the filthy cage in Jenny's basement. Nice. Yeah. So, so some of these uh, go off the rails pretty quickly. <laughs> I, I love um, the, um, you know, the, the figures. Uh, tell us the significance uh, of those because they're, they're chosen. Sure. You know, you've got the axe, you've got the pistol, you've got the... Describe uh, why you chose these figures and the what they're clown like. And the very popular clown pig, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, when I did my first reading, it was, uh, it was a full house. We had a really great crowd. They laughed a lot. And what happened is I didn't have titles for the stories then and, didn't, and wasn't as adept at reading and I didn't pace it correctly. Uh, so people didn't know when one story began and another like left off. They just didn't. Right. So what I did was I would the next time uh, filled with insecurity, I had a projectionist and that person would project the name of the story. And I used little Cracker Jack figures of which I had collected a few and some Milagros, Mexican Milagros. Mm -hmm. I'd worked in Mexico when I was young on and off uh, for quite a few years. So I was drawn to that culture into that those little figurines and they're very similar in some cases and so i took from my collection and um, accompanied them with the, with the figures so they were always part of that and i thought that if i did a book i'd incorporate them somehow and they were i used them as chapter headings right of course trying to illustrate 295 stories uniquely with even combinations of figures became impossible i couldn't actually support that many in the book Right. Uh, it, it just didn't work out. And also, I just, it was, uh, yeah, it just didn't work out. And there were technical reasons as well. Right. But it came from there. It came from there. I love the little figures and they 
the nice part about the public readings as well is with my person doing the slide, putting up the slide and then reading the title, they were almost like an opening comic act. Right. People would laugh. Uh, Persephone Palm, the, our local, one of our local uh, burlesque queens, she's a very funny person. Right. And she would get her own laughs, which was just splendid. Right. So it, it really did become a part of the act, yeah. I mean, there, there's clearly a, a, a stand-up comedy element to this. Who, who are the comics that, that you respond to or that you really like? Oh, so many. Um, gosh, I was watching Sarah Silverman the other night whose ability, again, to turn on a dime, like so many great comics, right. is just, I mean, she'll she'll do the setup. And I love the setup and the drop. And I think people do too. Right. There, mu there must be a deep need within us to be disappointed. Right. And believe me, buy my book, you'll be extremely disappointed. Yes. <laughs> over and over bit, again. It's, it's that calm, that, that great timing, like you say, the setup and then in a longer article, we would call them kickers, but there's that twist, the little twist of the knife, the little pull the rug out from under. Right. Um, but it's also kind of a, a sense of humor that, that you know, I don't know, do you get any pushback at all? It's almost like laughing at somebody that slips on a banana peel in, in some way. Oh, get anyone without saying, question. How can you laugh at these, these horrible things happening <laughs> to these people? How do you respond to that? I'm laughing right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I frankly expect more of it than I get. Uh, I think that if you hear one story, it's easy to object to it. But again, once you once you've read about a hundred of them, you realize it's a very Catholic approach. There isn't any particular focus. Um, I would welcome that conversation. I'd be fascinated by someone who does see. I'm sure there has to be a pattern in there. Right. Um, I haven't discovered it myself. Um, it's not something again like politics. Interestingly, uh, informatively for me. When I sit down and I want to and I want to write out, let's say something that I really care about, something I wish to tell someone, it doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. You know, something gleaned from the daily news. It just doesn't work that way. It needs to be abstracted. It needs to be. And that's not to soften any particular blow. It's just not the style of what I'm doing. And I again, I want to. It's important for me to. Um, to get to the bottom of it, let's say, and not. To me, that's too surface. If it's about Biden or it's about Trump or it's about this party or that party, that is not as interesting. It's a, it's a perfectly valid. I want to read that kind of comedy from someone else. Right. But that's not what that's not what makes uh, that's not what I find funny in my own stories. Right. So these were all, as far as I know, written before COVID. Any written during COVID? Because that, that, sure, the pandemic could definitely lends a dark sort of act, this kind of, uh, you know, um, black humor, I think, in a way. Um, were any of them written during the pandemic or? Without including the pandemic as a theme, um, I would say, I frankly expected the pandemic to affect my editing process in some way, right. but it really didn't. I guess I was always ready. I read a great deal of nonfiction and mm -hmm. I read about plagues and I read about science and I read about physics. I have, if, if there was one topic maybe that I have more than any other in the book, it's science. And right. I'm an amateur. I love thinking at least about particle physics and getting it wrong like everybody else. Um, so I'm always, it, to me, the disaster was always there, yeah. it, whether it was a world pandemic or a uh, meteor coming down. So it didn't affect it as much as I expected it to. Right. And I frankly, I didn't want it to, you know, it's like making at the old days when you made a mixtape, <laughs> when you made a mixtape full of great songs, right. there was always the mistake. And the mistake was the song that was popular at that time. Yes. It's the one that 20 years later does not make the cut anymore. Right? <laughs> right. Everything else is awesome. But then you have that clinker in there that was right. on the radio that week. So right. I didn't want that to happen with the book. I wanted it to be as again, as Catholic and wide ranging as that. I, I might sit down, I did write a few, some of the stories in the book are new. Mm -hmm. I did come from that time and were they affected by the pandemic? I'm not quite sure I'd say that. Right. I mean, in your actual life, 
are you a risk averse person? Do you, you know, <laughs> drive the speed limit? Do you, you don't go bungee jumping off the highest bridge? I mean, are you somebody who, who uh, you know, hey, if, if, if uh, one of these horrible things happen, uh, <laughs> I kind of deserved it. <laughs> you know, there have been times in my life, certainly when I was a risk taker, uh, or, you know, and uh, yeah, embarrassingly so, <laughs> but right now, I mean, I have a, you know, a life-threatening breathing disorder. Sometimes taking the dog for a walk is a giant risk, right. you know, and I make sure my wife is near the phone because I'm, it's 90 degrees out and I may need to be picked up somewhere off right. the ground. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so risk, risk changes, uh, in my world, but I would say I still push the envelope a little bit. Right. I try not to do it in any way that will, you know, what's the filter, right? right. You should, if you want to take a risk, you should, uh, hopefully you would do any, you would do whatever you were doing would not potentially injure someone else. Right. So within also, that definition. I, I find you such a upbeat, happy person. And, and this is such an unhappy, um, I assume it's it's sunny and not rainy and cloudy most days in Richard Loveridge's <laughs> world. But the characters in these, it's like storm clouds every, every day. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a first generation uh, American. My parents were born on a small island in the Adriatic. Hmm. And magic, if you will, uh, magical Christianity. Uh, there are exorcisms in my close family. Hmm. You know, there was a lot of, I grew up around a lot of strangeness. And my mother was a, funny person um, in this weird, dark Eastern European kind of world. Right. And I think, I think part of it starts there. And then of course I went to Catholic grammar school in the 1960s Bronx and you gotta laugh. That'll warp <laughs> you for sure. <laughs> right. So are you ready to read a few more? Of course. Beautiful. Go for back. <clears throat> Detour. Josephine put pen to paper, firmly committed to memorializing nothing but the amicable and happy moments of her life. Suddenly peckish, she made her roundabout way to the refrigerator, carefully avoiding the path through the living room where the bodies of her family lay, as they always had a way of bringing her down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Waste of. To Charlemagne, Connor had said, hey, dude. To Tesla, what's up, dude? To Aristotle, yo, dude. To Lincoln, watch out, dude. Perhaps the gift of time travel could have been better bestowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you do tap into the uh, au courant, uh, you know, <laughs> social media absurdity of everybody <laughs> curating their their hour to hour <laughs> life, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, this is, oh, here's one very specifically addressing, uh, uh, let me see. Is there, it's, a it's a little too rough for television. That's all right. We can, we can let it go. If it Here we go. Yeah. Reality TV. Hannah wanted to watch the irredeemable bitches of Lodi, New Jersey. Nicole had never missed an episode of Cooking Nothing Special all day and all night long. And Kyle was dead set on hopelessly stupid douchebags with tons of money. He had the remote, Nicole was wielding a chef's knife, and Hannah was passing a can of pepper spray from hand from one hand to the other. If only they had planned ahead of time and learned to DVR, the ensuing massacre need not have taken place. <laughs> Obviously, you're, t you're tapped into to pop culture. Do you watch a lot of TV and a lot of, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the current cultural uh, GIFs, memes, TikTok, I don't know, are you on all that? I, I do, I really enjoy, it's all very, very addicting. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, TikTok is, I, I mean, TikTok, I, I alternate between finding it refreshing and brilliant, which it can be, believe it or not, to just horribly repetitive and, and uh, rubber stamp and, you know, it's, anyway, but I do enjoy it. I. I think it's youth's attempt to say, at least my parents won't do this, but they're probably wrong, right? Ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> but Facebook is fascinating. I love keeping up with people. I love tidbits of information as well. And I like short stories. So of course, Facebook. Right. And television, I, I watch a little 
Um, I, I zoom through reality uh, TV and pieces of things, and I do enjoy learning, but uh, there's not a lot to learn there when it comes to reality TV. A little bit goes a really long way. Unfortunately, television is dying under its own weight. Um, I, right. I, it's the, what I'm obsessing on mostly with television lately is commercials. Right. You know, the fact that someone somewhere actually thinks that to watch a comedy movie on their channel, I'm talking to you, MTV, that to watch a comedy movie on their channel that you'll actually tolerate ad advertising breaks with nine commercials in them each. Right. That to me is a price that I'm not going to pay. And right. it's no wonder that young people, if you say television to young people, it's like saying, you know, buckboard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, and I don't, exactly. I don't blame them. And I don't know how they keep any audience at all, except in areas where there's no access to the internet. I mean, I really don't understand it. Right. And what is, I mean, I, I know you have a, a fertile mind that's always going a hundred miles an hour, but are you actually taking notebooks to create these or each day you're just setting and, and pulling it out of the, the, uh, cluttered uh, mind of Richard Loverich, or are you actually working at it like you would, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, one of your essays or something? It, it's a little of both, but you can't, you simply, you cannot sit down and, with a, and put a pen in your hand and say, go. It doesn't exactly work that way. Uh, it, it's a process of listening, frankly. Uh, listening and then abstraction. Right. So it's like, I think of, I guess I think of pachinko machines, you know, that right. you see with a little ball going past all the wires and bouncing randomly. Yeah. And then it ends up somewhere, but how it gets there, it's there's no formula that could do that, right? Yeah. And that is uh that's pretty that's pretty much the process. It, again, anything that's straightforward doesn't work. Right. It has to go through that randomizing, abstracting filter. Now, writing about my childhood, I'm actually, frankly, in the process now of, I do carry little notebooks with me. I do very well in uh, foreign environments, which of course, during the pandemic was not great. Right. So I'm much better at going to uh, a mall, a bar. These are places I normally wouldn't go and hang out for a moment, but right. even just simply having people around me, uh, if they don't have to do anything necessarily, but I find that very inspiring being yeah. around others. I, I know at one time, Lynn wanted me to go to uh, like Yado to a retreat for writing. I said, have you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> then I said, if you were to tell me to go hang out at the Port Authority yes. <laughs> yes. in New York City, yes. right, that I can get. <laughs> um, how about how about writers that inspire you? I, I think uh, at least in, in somewhat in the format, very short these micro stories Lydia Davis who's brilliant but she she's not going for the kind of stand-up comic right punchline in a way she's she's a very serious literary writer but any writers that that not just influence this that inspire you that you like to read if if I if you were to say um here you can take four books with you into the cell and they're they're your inspiration um I would take four books on science. Okay. Um, I love the analysis because to me, a lot of, if you read about science and scientific discovery, the mishaps, the, the things that were invented because it was a mistake that they invented it, the things that were invented that turned out to be horrible for the environment or for people, the person who invented something but got no credit for it, and there's something about that. And of course, it's, it's told almost entirely with a straight face. Mm. That, to me, that push and pull is the perfect, it creates the perfect set of like undulations, if you will, in my thought process. Right. And nothing else works as well. And then after that, it could be anything. Um, a, a Vanity Fair article, a New Yorker article, a commercial on television. But it's frankly among more erudite uh things that I that I get inspired and I to me they're because of course physics are absurd to begin with right you know what is it what are all those quotes that say that you know 
if you understand it, you haven't sp studied it carefully enough. <laughs> you know, to, uh, that, to, what's, what is more absurd than that? What is more absurd than spending hundreds of, frankly, now billions of dollars, studying billions of dollars a year on things that we can't see, that we don't know, that we're probably wrong about? Right. Uh, I love that absurdity. I, I need you to explain string theory, but, but probably <laughs> not enough time. <laughs> the book is Have a Very Bad Day uh, by Richard Loverich. We're going to add a link uh, where people can purchase it from our local independent bookseller, Bookhouse, of Stuyvesant Plaza. Right. Susan Novotny, a good friend of yours as well. Yes. And um, do you have any events? I, I know things are slowly opening up. Obviously, you have to be concerned with your uh, Alpha One, but are you going to be doing any, you know, bar readings or anything like that coming up? I, I am speaking to people right now. People have been cautious, um, um, more cautious, I thought, even than they were going to be, but things are cracking now. So expect yeah. some news. It'll be on uh, haveaverybadday.com. Right. I'll be posting some dates. Um, there is a, a shop that I'll be speaking at, which is kind of a neighborhood party. So it might end up spilling into the street. And there are cu a couple of club events too, as well as a, uh, a October, I don't know the date yet, but in October, I'll be at the Linda also appearing. Wonderful. So yeah, they are, they are beginning now. The conversations are coming back. So, so can you take us out with a couple more, uh, you bet uh, these unfortunate, uh, situations and incidents here we go here's a long one oven fresh hermione lifted her right ass cheek off the faux leather seat with mechanical precision careful to compensate by lowering her right shoulder to a sympathetic degree the fart was going to come out post haste and it would be far better she thought if it escaped seated instead of whilst heading for the door of the crowded boardroom, dragging the rancid, accusatorily faithful, viscous effluence behind her. A momentary bodily wince accompanied the release. What emanated forth, all but completely silently, wasn't a fetid plume at all, but rather the proprietor of a Parisian boulangerie, who could not even pronounce the word fart properly, and who smelled instead of fresh baked baguettes. No matter how pleasant his aroma, however, the baker, like the flatulence he replaced, was going to stick around a while. She pulled off the most convincing, who brought the French baker, shrug that she could muster before returning her guilt-tinged gaze to the jangle of financials spread before her. <laughs> Nobody does flatulence like Richard Lovers. <laughs> That's a really long one. <laughs> That's a great one. I think we've all been in that situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a maybe we haven't produced a French baker, but we have right. we've had our individual problems. Yes. Make way. Milton's prostate, diagnosed as enlarged, had also become quite enraged and no longer content to block only his urine flow, expressing newfound ambition. It was block, blocking traffic leading to the Lincoln Tunnel. <laughs> one more? Yeah, one more. Do the jerk. Her dance moves had become quite erratic and her expression vacant. If Clarence didn't know better, he would have thought that Ida was having some kind of perhaps epileptic fit. While he thought to investigate further into her condition, he left the party instead, as he knew nothing about girls and wasn't about to learn now. <laughs> That's wonderful. And uh, if you if you go to an event and uh, see Richard uh, Leverage live, hopefully you'll get one of these very cool bookmarks <laughs> that, uh, that I got, fantastic. Uh, the book is Have a Very Bad Day. It's been wonderful. Richard, I've been laughing and I think I need to go dry my eyes because I, I got some, some good uh, laughter out here. And thank you for sharing uh, this time with us on the conversation. Thank you, Paul, and to your viewers. Thanks very much. Thanks.